problem is with both groups of these Christians, conservative Protestants in America and liberal Protestants in America, is that they are both Gnostic. Protestant liberalism and the Bible, today on In the Shadow of the Cross. To in the Shadow of the Cross. I am Lauren Rosser, coming to you no longer from Dallas, Texas, but now from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And then uh, I'm here with my friend Jim Durkin, who's here all the way from Eureka, California. Uh, yes. And Eureka, then I found it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and then uh, and then Michael Harden coming from all the way in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. Well, you just said that all wrong. It's, Did I? Yeah, yeah. So, so here, you put a kiss in the middle of it. Lancaster. 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 Okay. It's, it's Lancaster, California. It's Lancaster, England. But here, because of the Pennsylvania Dutch, it's Lancaster. 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 I'm, I'll try to remember that. It, 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 a while, Lan- but put a kiss in the middle. Lancaster. It, it's okay because I said Milwaukee all wrong too. The locals here call it Milwaukee. Milwaukee. M- Milwaukee. <laughs> Have another beer. <laughs> right. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> all right. Well, we're continuing our discussion on the Bible, and last week we spoke about uh, what conservatives can do better when approaching the scriptures. So this time we're going to take a look at what could Protestant liberalism do better with the scriptures. So, um, as I mentioned at the end of the last week's podcast, these were the big, scary, bad guys that I wasn't supposed to mess with when I was growing up because they were all heathens and pagans and. <laughs> But uh, so, so what do you guys think? What could Protestant liberalism? Well, first of all, who, what, who are the Protestant liberals? I don't even know, to be honest. So Protestant liberalism in America can be traced back to the founding colonies, where you're dealing with the intellectuals in the congregational tradition, um, as opposed to the uh, Puritans and and the reform thinking in, in the in in. Um, the Puritan tradition in the, in the early colonies. And the Congregationalists were intellectual. They were also uh, wealthy. Uh, they founded the universities of Harvard and Yale along with their, it, I mean, whether you want to call them great or not, you know, they are certainly an institution, both those divinity schools. It's a group of, of clergy and uh, academics who are, Free thinkers, that would be the term in the age. They were free thinkers. And they did not feel bound to the authority of the Protestant church any more than the Protestant church felt bound to the authority of the Catholic church. Okay? So in other words, they were just giving to the conservative Protestant tradition what that tradition had given to the Catholics, you know? Now... There's going to be lots of arguments and debates about who's the true church throughout that 250-year period, what is true Christianity, what is real Christianity, uh, how do we purify Christianity. Uh, we can think in both both traditions, in both streams, these are just running arguments all the way in, into today. But our, the origins are in this uh, intellectual tradition, which by the 1800s, or even before, had rejected the doctrine of the Trinity and had become deists. And the metaphor that was used at that time was that God was like a watchmaker. He wound up the universe and create, created the watch, wound up the universe, and then he just, it's going on its merry way. And so, yes, there is a God, but that God is not a manipulative, interventionist deity. And, of course, you had the great, earthquake in Lisbon, I think it was 1789, I forget the year, uh, that created the crisis about the deus ex machina god, and you had writers like Voltaire and others, you know, castigating the church for this superstitious god, and so you, you were having these attacks, you know, 
on this view of God, and the conservatives would be attacking back and developing their apologetics at the same time. But fundamentally, we have to recognize right at the get-go the doctrine of the Trinity, which is the gospel, was set aside in favor of a... Because uh, the, the Janus face deity wasn't working anymore. The two-sided God wasn't working for these intellectuals. And so they just assumed that whatever the church had done, they had gummed it up. So better to have a, a God concept, you know, and, and always attached to that is goodness. God is good, right? Yeah. Or for the, the liberal Masonic tradition, God is light, you know. So that's the first thing to do. Then in the in the uh, 19th century in America, the liberal tradition begins picking apart the penal substitution theory, begins picking apart uh, the authority of Scripture, inerrancy, and all of that. The new emerging uh, discipline of archaeology and the new emerging discipline of history were both used as tools and weapons of war one against the other. They also attacked eschatology. The doctrine of hell as a concept went into great decline in the 18th and 19th century. And so even in the Catholic tradition in the late 20th century, hell doesn't play a significant role in Catholic theology. The remnants of it are just left in the uh, Protestant, uh, conservative Protestant tradition, really. But they were deconstructing all these things back then the same way we are today. The problem is they were doing it, in a sense, out of their own head. We're doing it by applying the revelation of the gospel of God himself, herself, to everything. So there's the, there's the big difference between what we're doing and what liberalism tends to do. Second thing is they denied the virgin birth they denied the resurrection from the dead. And that, that to me, was perhaps the most important thing. I can see them deconstructing everything else. But the moment you say Jesus is not raised from the dead, there's, it was a spiritual resurrection or something. Once you say that, you strip the human species of its only hope for life through death. Yeah. Not life after death, but life through death. And I, I personally also am going to take significant issue with the fact that the liberal tradition, perhaps, I mean, yeah, the liberal tradition in general has never, ever taken the time to think through the great dogmas and doctrines of Christianity. They've wholesale thrown the baby out with the bathwater. Now, in our time, the so-called progressive Christian tradition in America is neither progressive nor is it Christian. Hmm. Um, it has denied all the basic tenets of the Christian faith. It, it, it still may pay lip service to them, but they don't. They're they're not a functioning part of their thinking, and they have managed uh, to infiltrate in some horrid ways a very Marxist reading of Scripture. And they forced it upon us and said, you have to make a decision. Either our Jesus, this social justice warrior Jesus, is the Jesus, you know, that you have to follow. And he was following in the footsteps of the prophets. And they can go, see, we got Walter Brueggemann on our side, right? Okay. They're, 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 they have a forced reading of the life of Jesus through this lens of Marxist alienation. Now, the problem that they can never, ever seem to deal with is the fact that nonviolence is part and parcel of who Jesus is, and so is forgiveness. Because part of the whole progressive movement today is justice. Justice means retribution. I mean, look at California's trying to figure out how to pay um, uh, reparations, Okay. Man, you, you do that, and you are opening a floodgate of woe on America. Uh, and I'm, listen, I, I, you know, um, I'm not going to sit and bemoan my past or my ancestors' past. 
I'm trying to think of how to create a new world. I'm trying to think of the order that we need to bring out of the coming chaos. I'm not interested in trying to sustain the chaos. So for me, the liberal tradition has pretty much missed the boat entirely. They have no hope. They really don't have any faith. But they do, in some cases, have very genuine love. Of the greatest of these, love is the greatest, okay? And those, I think, in the liberal tradition that do recognize uh, the pacifism of Jesus, that do recognize his emphasis on forgiveness as a way of life, you know, I think they, they as long as they're living that gospel, then they're understanding Jesus. But when they want to justify violence in any way, shape, or form, and they want to do it in the name of Jesus, the same way the conservatives do, we have to, we have to say no. And so the same principle applies. I look at a liberal Jesus, and I ask, is this a sacrificial reading of Jesus or a non-sacrificial reading of Jesus? And as long as the liberal tradition continues to mix Jesus, the forgiving victim, up with the victim that's innocent but random in the Jewish scriptures, and they don't see a distinction between the two, they're always going to remain seeking justice. That's a Roman category. Paul says God has put everybody under disobedience in order that he might burn them all in hell. That's not what he says. He's put them all under disobedience so that he might have mercy on them all. Might have mercy and nobody them. gets to complain. There's no room for complaining or bragging. Wow, there is so much here that I want to touch on as we go through this whole hour. One of the things that's interesting, because you clarifying this, this really brought some clarity in my mind. Um, first of all, the, the, the whole thing of uh, it sounds like the, the whole liberal tradition is rooted in, because uh, you mentioned throwing the baby out with the bathwater. It sounds like it's rooted in an overcorrection. Um, that there's areas we have problems with, so we're going to overcorrect, turn, go completely into the ditch on the other side of the road. And it's interesting because it helped me understand also some of the reactions my conservative friends have to deconstruction. Because if if they're used to this overcorrection being what they see and hear, and then they they kind of see um, the the things we're talking about dealing in those same issues, um, you know, about uh, eternal conscious torment and, um, you know, a non-sacrificial view of Jesus. You could see how knee-jerk reactions would go off in the conservatives of like, oh, 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 that smells like that liberalism that went off into the other ditch. And so I like that in doing this podcast, I didn't realize how this would be bringing such clarity into the issue that it's like, because there's such nuance, I'm realizing, in what we're talking about versus going off the other edge of the road and throwing the baby out with the bathwater. I have, uh, well, first of all, let me let me just uh, pause there and second and say, you guys have any thoughts on that? I think it's a a, a uh, very valid point, and, and that's pretty typical among religious people, let me put it that way. There's always this pendulum swing. I remember one time, many, many years ago, there was a, a person that was pretty popular in the, in the uh, conservative uh, church circles, and he was going around holding conferences. We've got to get back to preaching hell. We've got to warn people about hell. And I mentioned it to my dad, and he said, oh, are we back to that now? <laughs> and I, I, I looked at him, I said, what do you mean? And he said, we do these m massive pendulum swings where for so long we we're the love of God, the mercy of God, the kindness of God, and now we want to make this massive pendulum swing all the way over. Yes, but now we got to talk about the severity of God and the justice of God and hell and damnation and and eventually people are going to get tired of that and they're going to want to swing the pendulum way over here again. And we always overcorrect. It's like the pendulum never seems to stop in the center. <laughs> exactly. Because it's it's like, um, 
you know, the, the whole thing of uh, th- that earthquake you mentioned that happened in 1789, Michael, that, you know, made people go, oh, Jesus isn't Superman. God's not Superman. So we're just going to throw out God now. You know, or he's yeah. he's he's now he now winds up the earth, you know, the deist view. He now winds up the earth created. It winds it up and, and flew away somewhere. And, you know, I remember that very clear from ninth grade history class. Oh, yeah. Um and uh, and so it, it, it's it, again, it's that thing of just overcorrect because here's the problem. So we're just going to go to this other extreme now. And then and then Michael, as you point out, at a lot of the extremes, they're not even like. See, the, the thing that's admirable is you and others like you. They wrestled with the scriptures of okay, so Jesus isn't Superman. Well, then how do we move in line with who Christ is and who he revealed the father to be to see something different where it's like the, the liberal just kind of goes, ah, throw it away, (laughs) you know, come up with something out of the top of our head, you know? Um, So I I find that really, really interesting, but also disturbing, you know, that it's, it's kind of like just a total, let's just totally detach, you know, from, from everything. Just, uh, just, so could we un, un, untangle some of the statements that you made in, in uh, your opening remarks? The first thing that I remember you saying is the first thing they did was they did away with the uh, Trinitarian or the triune Godhead. Can you elaborate on that a little bit, Michael? How did, how did they do that? What did they put in its place? Well... Remember, it's at this time we have the emerging historical critical method, which is being applied. In other words, the Bible is not a divine book. It's a great book. It might even have revelation about God in it. But, but, it, but we're going to look at it through the lens of the human mind and, and reason. And so the, one of the first things that happens is, I, I don't, I, I kind of, for me, it's almost like a, a flare going up in the sky. But at the very beginning of the historical critical method, is this fellow known as, his, his last name is Ramirez. And he writes this little book on Jesus. And in that little book, Jesus is a zealot revolutionary. Mm. And that thesis will get picked up once in a while. It gets picked up again in the 20th century by SGF Brandon. It's dismissed by scholarship got picked up again a few years ago in a book written by um, uh, a journalist. And not even, it's, not, it's terrible. It's a terrible book. The history is bad. The research is poor. Uh, it was called Zealot. And this guy even made it, you know, to the major news shows, Good Morning America, CNBC, whatever, all, you know, talking about his book. And, and the liberal progressive Christians, they loved it because Jesus is anti-institutional. You know, Jesus is anti-establishment, you know, and they failed to recognize that this is the most idolatrous form of Jesus possible to turn him into this kind of a figure. Mm-hmm. He came, mm-hmm. he was not Barabbas, the son of another father, a father that lies and kills. He was Barabbas, the true son of the father. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. and they conf- and the, the progressives have confused the two. Wow. Yeah, I, I made uh, several notes here on different things because you touched on uh, forgiveness, reparations, um, Marxism. Um, w- one of the things that immediately went off in my head was I remember having a conversation with somebody during the uh, – uh, when the Black Lives Matter marches and stuff were happening. And, and I happened to bring up the uh, – the, the peaceful protests from the sixties with the MLK and, and, you know, the civil rights movement and uh, the person's response to me, I actually found it jarring because the person said, you know, I said, well, we need to follow the teachings of Jesus, you know, how, how he showed that, uh, that you take a stand against something, you know, you do it peacefully. And he says, well, you know, that works in some um, protest situations uh, when it's particularly advantageous in those times to use peace. But he goes, but there are times when you really have to utilize violence and that's, that's what's needed. And that's the only way the state sometimes will pay attention. And I was just like, dude, wow, we, we are not following the same Jesus here. No. And, and the thing is, the absurd thing is they think they're going to win against the state. They have no idea how powerful the state is. 
you know, and within a few years, if you're that kind of person, the state will just shut down your checking account. Good luck. Mm-hmm. Right. No, they're fools. And those who live by the sword will die by the sword. So in, in dismissing the, the Trinity, did they dismiss God himself? Well, they, just, they, they would have had to. There would have been no father. God is not paternalistic. You okay. know, we're not God's children, or, or we're all God's children. Or we're all God's children. Yeah. And so God is what? God is On vacation. spirit? God is energy? God is... Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, they would use the term spirit. We, we, the, the Greeks and the moderns might use the term energy, but God is spirit. Yes, yeah, spiritual. And this is the thing is, you can't know anything about God. So you there's can't a, define him. Yeah, faith is on the other side of reason. This is Lessing's very, very, very famous ugly ditch. You know, history can take you so far, and if you want to believe anything else, you're making a leap of faith into something else. But you can't prove any of it. So maybe we need to change our pronoun. Maybe it's not uh, him. Maybe it's they, them. (laughs) I'm not not touching that. Um, (laughs) It's absurd. It's absurd. The the um, hyper differentiation that's happening in our culture. Uh, but hey, it's a it's a sign of the times. We should have seen this coming twenty years ago. Does it go to prove that if you strip God of His deity, if you create a, a an idolatrous uh, Jesus, that you're left with? no appreciation or understanding then of who who humanity is either. That's going to be true. And so what happens, the great, the best move, the best move that could ever happen was in the, I think it was the 1840s or 50s, when Ludwig Feuerbach, the philosopher, came out and said, all human declarations about divinity or God are nothing more than human projections out mm-hmm. there to the nth degree. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That was very important because it said that anything you want to think about God is really in your head. Now, of course, the liberal tradition, parts of it would reject that. You know, you know, God is beyond reason, but that doesn't mean that there's no such thing as a God. And the conservatives would hate it, of course. But Feuerbach was absolutely right. Everything that we humans think about God is not God. And we would be bereft if God had not revealed God's self to us. Correct. So when I look at early atheism, and Feuerbach was a student of Marx, I would rather follow Feuerbach than I would the modern Christian progressive reading marxist reading of scripture you know the thing i find really fascinating in in this discussion is because i've never had um christian liberalism defined for me as you know what it is and and what it looks like and what the points of it are and so the thing i'm finding interesting is as as you guys are sharing this i'm i'm seeing i see this everywhere it's all over the place. I, I hear it in movies. I hear the, the this line of thinking mm-hmm. in uh, mm-hmm. uh, among uh, among friends, peers. Um, I, I didn't realize how prevalent this thinking is. The Marxist Jesus, the the uh, um, the the justice warrior Jesus, the um, the immigrant Jesus. You know. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, all, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you know, all, it's it's. I get all a check out of people go. Jesus is an immigrant. I'm thinking he was <laughs> Jewish. He lived in Palestine. He was in the military. Agree. Right, yeah, because they try to say the thing of going down to Egypt, which... Well, and who's doing that? It's the liberals that are doing that. They're the very ones that denounced the whole virgin birth story as myth to begin with. Now they want that little piece to be historical. That's the thing that drove me batty, too, because I was like, wait a minute. So that part's fake, but we're going to build this whole doctrine we're going to fight over on, yeah. on this other part. Well, it's like you can't just pick and choose what parts yeah, you yeah, want yeah. and what parts you don't, you know. Liberal, so, liberal Christianity can't execute itself out of a paper box. Yeah. It, it, now, I, I, the, I find this very, very fascinating, this conversation, because... 
I have uh, a number of friends, uh, not all who have embraced a, a more liberal, you know, interpretation of things, but I have some who would argue with you on almost every point you made. They consider themselves to be very liberal, but they would say, well, I still believe in the Trinity. I still believe in the virgin birth. I still believe in, you know, historical Jesus, uh, you know, as the Son of God, and so on and so forth. It's just that I also believe... And then they get in the whole thing of social justice and, okay. Okay, and the equality fine. of man. Okay. Now, I don't have a problem with those folks. Okay. I, mean, I don't have a problem with anybody. But what I'm saying, Jim, yeah. here is that what you have there is a socially conscious evangelical. Okay. okay? Of, the, of the Ron Sider type of tradition. Mm -hmm, okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, and they can they can trace that part of the, their tradition all the way back into the Civil War period, you know, when the Evangelical Church was the abolitionist church, you know. Okay, so they have a history of that. That's great. I don't mind any of that as long as they are committed then also. If they're going to be committed to love your neighbor as yourself, you know, treat your neighbor as you want to be treated, which means being welcoming and affirming, you know, it means trying to, to get our government to do the right thing when it, when it comes to uh, those within our culture that are left behind and stepped on and forgotten, you know. Um, but does it mean that we have now to put uh, victimization uh, and, uh, rep and retribution and everything right up front and center? Should we, as liberal people, See, I'm a I'm I'm liberal in that sense, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. instead of putting my identity into anything that culture wants me to do, I'm a cis white male, but whatever, I, whatever I am, whatever they think I am, my identity is is found in recognizing that just like everybody else, basically, if push comes to shove, I will hurt you, and just knowing that potential is that and recognizing that my life's journey is about getting rid of that you know so instead of being a pain causer i'm a healer um that to me is the would be the best kind of approach i i would say if the liberal tradition was willing to do it you know but but again, you know, in their conferences, you look at all their conferences, conference speaks all the same. That same rehashing, rehashing, rehashing. You got Richard Rohr for a little spirituality. You got your Brian McLaren for a little bit of like, oh, we're going to have this great conversation. You've got sometimes Shane Claiborne mixed in. You've got the Nadia Boltz Weber with all her tats and piercings, you know, and how cool and everything. It's all the same. It's all the same. And it hasn't accomplished anything. It has not accomplished a thing. Now, the right hasn't accomplished anything either. But problem is with both groups of these Christians, conservative Protestants in America and liberal Protestants in America, is that they are both Gnostic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is Philip Lee's thesis in his book Against the Protestant Gnostics, published in 1987. And he traces the history of both conservatism and liberalism shows that they're arguing over an identical set of presuppositions which are fundamentally Gnostic in nature. Mm. And so when I look across the swath of American Protestant Christianity, I do not see orthodoxy. I do not see an adherence to the revelation of the Father and the Son by the Spirit. I do not see the church practicing the life of Christ what I see is Gnosticism in its many forms. And if you just have the right knowledge, you're going to be good to go. If you think like I think, you're good to go. That's sad, but that's the way it is. There's a third way out. We're on it. Might be part of the next Jesus revolution. That would be fun. Who knows? <laughs> so when you say they're both Gnostic, how is, how is the liberalism, how, how is that Gnostic? Liberalism is, um, 
what you were saying earlier, and, and I say this very tongue-in-cheek, but liberalism is the enemy to the gospel. <laughs> and, and that was that was basically a uh, statement uh, by a friend of mine, and um, I understand why he would say that, but again, it's the same thing that we were talking about earlier. It's that knee-jerk reaction. Uh he had a very good friend of his, a close friend of his, a co-worker, whatever, that began to uh, take a look at, at some of the flaws of the, the conservative church and whatever. And as a result, he began to take a look. Let's see what the other side looks like. And he has gone all the way off the ditch, you know, uh, in that direction, and so, so my friend says, "Well, uh, you know, uh, he warns against anybody uh, even taking a look at, you know, what may be considered liberalism, or reading some of the articles or or books uh, by people that would be considered liberals, and and it's like somehow." Even though I, I appreciate what uh, Michael's saying, they're both narcissism, and he's going to explain that in a minute. But somehow we've got to come to the table, both conservative and liberal, and find our path back to the gospel. Uh, you know, where have we where have we wandered away from? Uh, you know, from the gospel from. Uh, I like the way Michael says it. Uh, God revealed in Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. And I, I think right. that's a wonderful way to express it, that um, it isn't Father, Son, Holy Spirit as somehow three persons who are somehow melded together into one. It's one. God is one. And I, I, I appreciate that. Um Michael, you wanted to uh, pick up on Lauren's question there? So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to mention the six areas uh, that Philip Lee's going to highlight in his book uh, against the Protestant Gnostics. Um, first, a Gnostic emphasize an, emphasizes an alienated humanity, whereas the Gospel emphasizes a good creation. So then for the Gnostic... Matter, the material world, is is evil. You know, blood, sweat, semen, tears, right? It's evil. Uh, and in the case of the liberal, things like institutions, um, a government, you know, money and power, okay? The earthly is evil. The heavenly is good. So there's your dualism. Um, knowledge that saves is Gnostic. If you believe the right thing, you get your secrets, you get the secret keys, secret wisdom, secret knowledge, you're saved. Versus the salvation through the mighty hand of God in Jesus. Gnosticism is always salvation through escape. So whether it's liberal utopianism or fundamentalist rapture theory, uh, salvation is always through escape versus salvation through pilgrimage. Hmm. Is the Christian motif. Um, the emphasis in Gnosticism is on the knowing self rather than the believing community. Wow. So you have your origins of the problem of what Rene called the romantic lie, the concept of individualism as it's been propounded since the Enlightenment. You have a spiritual elite Always, there's an elitism in Gnosticism. The higher up the ladder you can go, the more visions you can have, the more you're gifted at prophecy, dream interpretations, whatever, whatever, whatever. Whether it's academic elitism, the more degrees you have, the more books you write, you know, whatever, 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 whatever. So there's always an elitism versus ordinary people. Okay. Right? And it should be said that the three of us are just lay people. I just happen to have spent a lifetime uh, with my spare time doing lots of reading. <laughs> and, you know, okay, finally, 
um, there's uh, a selective syncretism in Gnosticism versus particularity within the within the uh, Christian tradition. So you're going to have a multiplicity uh, of gods, and some of these documents that that were discovered at Nashamadi in uh, the same year the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered, uh, when you read them, you can go through three pages of a thousand different names of God, you know, and you can see these poor fools trying to go, I'm going to get you with one of these. I know you're in there. <laughs> wow. So that's Gnosticism, but Gnosticism is basically um, built into the warp and woof of Protestantism uh, since and with the advent of Calvinism. Now, Lutheranism escapes, can Lutheranism can escape this as long as it doesn't become evangelical if it follows Luther, uh, and the Anabaptists can escape this, although they have gotten evangelicalized just as bad as every other group out there. And they're even letting uh, pacifism uh, become almost a, uh, they're letting it go. The Anabaptist tradition is, is there are Mennonite churches now that have uh, police officers as members and they, they carry their weapons with them in church. Church is a weapons-free zone, man. Wow, so that, that's interesting um, because it's like I'd always heard about Gnosticism coming into the church and all that kind of stuff. And by the way, I have that book. Um, it's it's in boxes right now because <laughs> of my move. Um, I did buy it, but I haven't started reading it yet. Um, but the reason I wanted to read it was because all I ever got when I was told what Gnosticism is, it was always just, well, it's secret knowledge. It's going after secret knowledge. And, and, and I was like, well, how does that help me? How does that, you know, so that, that helped um, you opening that up to show, cause you, the things you hit on. Yeah. I see, see that everywhere. I mean, um, take, take for example, several examples. You have the charismatic who want secret knowledge, you know, mm -hmm. go to prophecy seminars, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. you have, the conservative evangelical uh, intellectual layperson who wants to learn the Greek, as they say, mm -hmm. to learn the Greek, uh, so that they can find that little secret hidden nugget there in Scripture. You've got to find those nuggets. You know, they're they're buried, but it's all. And then, of course, f for the liberal, uh, the secret knowledge is they know they're right. Everybody else is wrong. <laughs> Right. You're, wrong. you're wrong because you're white, you're an American, you're a male, you're this, that, and the other. You're automatically, uh oh, ipso, wrong. I had a, a discussion with a brother that it went like that where everybody else was wrong but him. And, and I remember it reminded me of the scene in, if you've seen the third Indiana Jones movie, where uh, he's lost in the desert and he goes, everybody's lost but me. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, that's how so many Christians look. But anyway, get, getting to the thing you're, you're talking about with the um, liberalism, so much of it, it's, it, it is, it's rooted in the fight, you know, yeah. the, the fight against injustice, the fight against it, which looks well, like you said, it's like, there's nothing wrong with it. And, and in fact, it's even my heart as well that the outcasts be brought in. But if the, but it also means bringing in the oppressor too. Well, and let, that's where we run into the problem. Here's the reality. The reality is that the uh, conservative evangelical tradition really is a, a mythic form of Christianity. It's totally sacrificial. Okay. Uh, and it even brings God into our death-dealing processes. God requires Jesus to die. It's horrible. Um, and in that sense, there's no difference between the conservative evangelical view of things and the mythological view of things. The liberal tradition is following Abel and uh, many of the psalmists who... Uh, when they were being oppressed, cried out for God to bring vengeance and justice and wipe out the enemy. But neither of these traditions has learned yet to follow the Prince of Peace, the Son of the Father, the, the peacemaker of all. And they're still both tied to religion and they're still both tied to violence because behind religion is violence. Violence is the origin of the sacred. 
So it, it goes without saying that in our world, there is an incredible amount of injustice. Marginalized peoples, uh, groups, uh, et cetera, et cetera. How does the gospel of peace, how does a um, nonviolent, non-retributive uh, approach of loving our neighbor as we love ourselves? Uh, how does that work uh, without falling off into simply committing ourselves to social justice issues so that we're really presenting the gospel? Well, well one, it, it would be a willingness to affirm that the one we see in the Father, I'm the one we see in the Son by the Spirit is the Father. We don't have a God concept. Excellent. I don't believe in a God or a God concept. I believe in the Father. I trust the Father. There are benefits that the liberal Christianity has brought to the table, and I, I shouldn't want us to go off broadcast without mentioning those. Um, and there have been great liberals. Uh, the perhaps, perhaps in my mind, in America... Uh, there were two absolutely incredible liberal theological thinkers, and I am not talking about the Niebuhrs. I'm talking about uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., and I'm talking about William Stringfellow. These two um, were both committed pacifists. These two understood that if there was to be real change, there were going to be scapegoats. There was going to be persecution, but that that we could win over they they could win over the heart of the world by just simply being Jesus and allowing God to do God's work. And the world saw, you know, uh, the both most majority black, but some white uh, protesters being beaten, sprayed with fire hoses, thrown in jail, murdered. You know, and, and, and the world saw it, and then America kind of woke up to it going, what are we doing? Right? But there was this self-sacrifice that took place in that movement. There were always the, the Emmett Tills and the Dr. Kings and others. Now, that, if, if that were liberal Christ, progressive Christianity today, if, if they, we did like they did, they would go into the churches and they would smack each other, spit on each other, curse each other out. They, they trained for this, right? We're just sending people out to protest now who have no training in non-retaliation and forgiveness. They have not been trained. You have to be trained in these things. That's the point of being a disciple. That's the point of discipleship within the Christian community. No, we're just sending everybody out as sheep amongst wolves, and they're getting slaughtered, mm -hmm. right? Great. It's not, yeah. right? Or, or, or all we have is just tons of pent-up resentment out there. Mm -hmm. you know? And the right hates the left, and the left hates the right. And yeah. I say with the Apostle Paul, you're all under disobedience. God loves mm -hmm. all of you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It's through your head. Exactly. No, I keep a, because as we're talking about forgiveness and respiration, uh, reparations and, and all that kind of stuff, well, the thing that keeps going through my head is I, I keep remembering this story that I heard. It was, it was published in a paper um, in Campbell County, Virginia, um, just recently where um, there was a, uh, back um, in, in the, uh, prior to the Civil War, there was a, 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 a black man who was a free man who fell in love with a woman who was a slave. And he wanted to marry her. But in Virginia, they, it was illegal for a free man to marry a slave. So he either had to keep his freedom or he had to, had to become a slave again. And so he wanted to marry this woman. So he found a white man who he could trust, who happened to be his next door neighbor, and sold um, and, and said, will you, in a sense, buy me and all my property? And, and the white man 
bought him, bought all his property, but just let him have it, didn't do a thing with it. Just And, and that black man lived, and the, the reason this was in the paper was the family was looking for um, descendants from this white man. His name was Thomas who had had done that they said because after um after the civil war when uh when the slaves were freed he went down to the courthouse and gave everything back to his neighbor um and that black family said everything we have today is because of that man thomas uh-huh. um, that that man thomas his name is thomas rosser he's uh-huh. my great 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 uh uncle oh. um and my cousin went down and met with that family to say, yeah, I'm a descendant of, of, of that family and stuff. But see, you don't hear that. This was in the slave state. This was a white man. And so that's what, when we talk about this stuff with forgiveness, and, and that's my problem when we get into the liberalism and, and the identity politics, we get into, it gets into such generalities that it misses that right there in Campbell County, Virginia, was a white man who was living the gospel. Yeah, in a very powerful way. Okay. So yeah, when when I heard that story, I was uh, I was just blown away because I was going, oh my gosh, that's my heritage, you know. Mm. And but but see, it, he was he didn't go down and protest or take up arms or um, he just simply did for his neighbor what justice he he brought justice to his neighbor. Yes, in, with without taking up weapons, without any kind of fight or anything, he did what was right for him. And and to me, that's what that's what I see is doing justly it's it's not bringing retaliation it's doing what's right for for your neighbor for your fellow man and in his case it was his actual physical neighbor <laughs> i i appreciate that story for for this reason because probably all of us know at least one person that is facing some area of uh injustice in their life and we have an opportunity to show them the kindness, the love, the mercy of the Lord in walking with them through that, or perhaps alleviating that injustice. But what so many of us think in terms of is we think in terms of the great injustices upon whole sectors of society and we're like well I can't do anything about that (laughs) you know I can't solve the homeless problem I can't solve uh you know the the uh Native American issue you know of should we give them back their land or not give them back their land or or you know whatever and in, in instead of looking to all these social issues in the world. I think, Lauren, what you're saying is, what about just looking out our front door at the neighbor? Exactly. That's a, That was exactly my point, is, is we tend to look at these grand lofty scales. And, and, and the truth is it becomes an excuse because I, I can't do anything, like you said, about some massive issue. And so it lets me have an excuse because I'm going to take the correct side on that issue, but I'm not going to do anything about it. It, it lets me, in a way, have an escape. Where, mm-hmm. on the other hand, if it's my neighbor who's right in front of me, that's where it is. And it's like, because that's my thing. It's like when, when they'll say, like, the government needs to give more money to the poor. The government needs to give more money to the poor. Yeah, true. I agree. But um, what are you doing? How much money is coming out of your wallet to help the poor? Well, and then I, it's crickets. <laughs> I, I would say the government does not need to give more money to the poor. The government is a lousy, lousy, louser dispenser of cash. <laughs> I agree first with you. All, yes, first that's of true. All, first of all, this is this is. We, we want to think the government is responsible. The government is irresponsible. Mm-hmm. That's the first thing. All right, you know. Right. And especially modern government is grossly irresponsible. But what we can do, as you said, is uh, open the front door. And Jacques Alou put it best. He said, God had never told us to go love the world. That's God's job. We're just simply to love the neighbor. And the neighbor's neighbor. whoever is next to you, whoever it is that's there in your life. That's your neighbor, Right. 
Exactly. So... And, and Jesus made a very clear point through his one of his stories of who our neighbor is. Oh, yeah. It's whoever you are. Our, our, our neighbor is uh, not only the nice guy that lives next door that we have really friendly chats over the fence with, our neighbor is also our enemy who yeah. lives on the other side of our our house. That's exactly right, Jim. That's, yeah. that's so true. And we become Christ's light to both. Yes. We treat both the same. Although we might drink beer with one and not the other. No. <laughs> <laughs> but I like that, Michael. We treat both the same. So, yeah, well, there's, there's benefits and there's debits to both conservative and Protestant American Christianity. Uh, I would say, uh, as a whole, uh, uh, if historians look back in several hundred years and things like that, I think it'll be deemed a failure. I don't think there's going to be an awful lot that can be mined from American church life for the good of future Christianity. They'll probably, I'm, I'm thinking they'll, they'll probably look at certain moments that occurred, like the Jesus oh, yeah. People movement and things like that, yeah. and say, say there was some beauty that occurred there, there was some value there. But, but I think you're right. Overall, on the, it's funny how we talk about the Dark Ages as being medieval times, you know. And it's like I, I almost wonder if they'll look at this as kind of a Dark Ages, you know. Well, I think they will. I really do. Um, because we we will have literally descended into uh, not just metaphorical dark darkness, but we're heading into cultural darkness, a time of war. Uh, I expect the U.S. to be at war uh, in the Pacific uh, with China. Uh, I would venture to say as early as this autumn, but but into next year. You know, my hope is that that war is short. You know, not prolonged. My hope is that it does not involve invading troops. But the world is spinning uh, out of control. And uh, always, 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 it has relied upon the mimetic scapegoating mechanism to bring order back. Right. So I'm on the keen watch right now to see who's going to be blamed for the woes that we're going through could it be putin could be could it be trump could be could it be a leader we don't know that's out there could be could, they're going to find somebody like a hitler type figure mm -hmm. that's big enough to encompass this global wrath you know uh and i hope that the gospel's so powerful that that figure doesn't arise and humanity has to figure out a different way to relate other than sacrificing mm. each other Yes. Mm. All right, guys. Well, we're actually about out of time, and that's the perfect place to end it. So, once again, really good conversation. And uh, so, uh, Jim, where can people find your book? Amazon.com. Bring up either my name or uh, Dying of Thirst on the Bank of the River. All right. And, Michael, where can people find your stuff? Uh, YouTube and um, at Amazon. All right. Well, thanks, you guys, and uh, everybody listening, thanks for joining us, and we look forward to talking to you all again next week. Bye.